Um, my name is Roy Rickard. I'm the Defence Professor of Military Surgery. Um, this eponymous lecture is named after George James Guthrie. And Guthrie is arguably the greatest military surgeon uh, in the UK. Born in London in 1785 to a Scottish mother and an Irish father, into a family of naval surgeons, he had a precocious early career, passing membership of the Royal College of Surgeons of England in March 1801, two months before his 16th birthday. His most notable operational deployment was to be the Peninsula Campaign with Sir Arthur Wellesley, another Irishman, later to be Duke of Wellington. Guthrie was wounded in both legs uh, by musket ball fire, and he contracted typhoid uh, and was invalided back to the UK. But he did, however, return to the peninsula, operating on thousands of patients, uh, sometimes working 18 hours each day for weeks at a time. His most notable accomplishments include distal arterial ligation, fasciotomies, avoiding the ligation of nerves, and advocating accurate bony reduction of femoral fractures. After discharge from the army, Guthrie rose to be president of the Royal College of Surgeons of England on four occasions and died on his birthday in 1856, age 71. Our speaker this year for the Guthrie Lecture is Professor Ian Roberts. Uh, Ian Roberts is Professor of Epidemiology and Public Health and Coordinator of the Clin Clinical Trials Unit at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. Ian first trained as a paediatrician and then in epidemiology at the University of Auckland, New Zealand and at McGill University, Canada. He established and is coordinating editor of the Cochrane Injuries Group, an international network of individuals that prepares and maintains systematic reviews of the effectiveness of interventions in the prevention, treatment, and rehabilitation of injury. Professor Roberts is principal investigator of the CRASH trials, the large international randomized control trials that seek better ways to treat seriously injured trauma patients. Professor Roberts, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, so I want to talk about trauma as a global public health problem. Um, and probably the, this is my only slide about the extent of the problem. There are about 5 million deaths a year, um, almost twice as many deaths from trauma as there are from HIV, malaria, and tuberculosis combined. And there are millions of disabled people. Um, but that's it. I, I, Usually, when an epidemiologist is asked to talk about trauma, um, they, they, they're expected to spend their whole talk talking about the burden, how big and how important the problem is. But I don't believe that's very helpful, because I think if you've got a big problem that you can't do anything about, and a small problem that you can do something about, then actually the small problem is the important problem. So actually, the size of the problem isn't the issue. It's what we can do about it that really matters. And um, so, for example, this, you know, and there's lots of trauma all around the world. And so the thrust of my argument is trauma is a global public health problem. So we need to work with trauma doctors globally to solve it. And, and, and the sort of the thrust of this presentation is that actually information we get from global clinical trials is often very widely applicable and not just applicable in the, in the particular locations where we do those trials. So what works in trauma? So trauma is a big, it's a huge problem, but we've got very little reliable evidence on the effectiveness of interventions in, in, in trauma treatment and rehabilitation. Actually, our knowledge for trauma prevention is much greater. There are many proven effective interventions in the area of road safety, for example. But actually, in managing seriously injured patients, the evidence base is much worse. So um, we don't know really what works. Very large treatment effects are unlikely. Um, but even if something had a bit of an effect, you know, even if a tr an intervention reduced the risk of death or serious disability by a modest amount, that could be really important. 
But to find modest treatment effects, we've got to do large clinical trials. And so this is the kind of reasoning that our group came to about 20 years ago. And they thought, okay, we've got to do what the cardiologists did and do very large trials to find, um, you know, uh, moderately effective interventions that could make a big difference worldwide. So, you know, we had big trials in cardiology like ISIS-2, you know, that showed aspirin and, and thrombolysis were effective after myocardial infarction. We needed that sort of information, I believed, in trauma management. And so, if we want to do big trials, if we don't want them to take forever, we have to work with trauma surgeons in lower middle income countries because there's lots more trauma there. So this is road injury deaths as a map. And so Africa, the road injury death rates are really high. Africa and Asia, uh, slightly less so in South America. But doing, doing a, a large trial just in the UK would take a very long time. If we want, uh, so there's there's uh, blunt injury from road traffic crashes if we want penetrating injury. The sort of global homicide map, which is where you'd find um, penetrating injury, is very much in Africa again, uh, the Russian Federation, and Latin America, uh, and the Caribbean. So if we want to do trials um, for, say, exsanguinating penetrating hemorrhage, we've got to work with people in those sorts of places. So that's what we started off doing. So that when we started, we reviewed all the evidence for the effectiveness of, of interventions in uh, trauma management, and head injury in particular. It was at a, at a time half the world's neurosurgeons thought that steroids were effective. The other half thought they were dangerous. And so we thought, well, somebody's got to be right. Let's see if we can work together and um, you know, find out who's right and who's wrong. So we managed to do a large randomized controlled trial um, involving 240 hospitals in uh, near enough 50 countries. We randomly allocated 10,000 patients to get corticosteroids or placebo. And then we got this shocking result. It shocked me because I thought corticosteroids were going to be effective. In general, you do, you do clinical trials because you, you're looking for an effective intervention. So I'd looked at the animal data and, and um, the previous data from randomized controlled trials, and I was really uh, looking forward to demonstrating that steroids were effective. But as this slide shows, you know, there was 21% dead in the treated group, 18% dead in the, in the not corticosteroid treated group. So corticosteroids increased the risk of death um, modestly, but importantly. And in fact, when we eventually published this, um, the, the sort of um, cover story in The Lancet, somebody worked out how many deaths in Europe corticosteroids had caused um, because people were using them when they were not effective, in this case, harmful. So something like 10,000 deaths. So we were able to do that trial because we had a big international network of doctors from all around the world working together. And it just so happens, it, this is the closing meeting of the CRASH-2 trial, of the CRASH-1 trial, and you know, we had the national coordinators from all of the countries. And we actually managed to combine it with the opening meeting of the next trial, which is the CRASH-2 trial. Um, now this is motivated by an invention of these people. This, this is uh, Shosuke and Utako ok Okamoto, husband and wife a research team working in Japan in the, late, in the, in the 1960s. That's their daughter in the foreground because there wasn't any childcare in those days and they, they took their daughter to work with them. Um, and so they were very interested in coagulation and hemorrhage and they'd noticed that if you put blood into a test tube, it initially clots and then if you leave it a little bit longer, it unclots. And they were interested in the unclotting process. They knew it was um, an enzymatic process and th there was the enzyme, it was, it was through the enzyme plasmin. So plasmin breaks down fibrin blood clots. And they thought, well, if we could find a drug that inhibited this breakdown of fibrin blood clots, perhaps we could use it to, to uh, reduce deaths from bleeding, to reduce exsanguination. Um, they did lots of experiments on dogs, 
that was not uh, that unusual. What is unusual is that they used to eat the dogs afterwards. This was Japan at a time when it was a very poor country. There, were, there wasn't much food around. Um, and so um, Utako, who I met, I, I didn't meet the husband, he died, but Utako, uh, I met her when she was 96. Uh, she told me about th this eating of the dogs. It's interesting, uh, I tell these stories because I'm convinced it's the only thing people remember um, when you're giving talks. So for example, I talked about tranexamic acid, which was the drug they eventually uh, uh, invented, and this um, eating the dog thing, and, I, then, and a trauma surgeon came up to me and said, Ian, what's the name of that dog invented by that Japanese bird who ate her dog? So these stories are not the site. These stories are all you'll, all you'll remember, probably. So anyway, first they screened a, a load of amino acids to see if they would inhibit this enzyme plasmin. And they found that lysine was very inhibitory. So lysine inhibited this enzyme plasmin. But they were good biochemists, and they looked at the shape of the molecule, and they wondered if they could get a better, um, you know, get a better inhibitor of, of uh, plasmin. And they found this was more inhibitory. And this is the, this is aminocaproic acid. So actually, they've invented a new class of drugs. Aminocaproic acid was the first antifibrinolytic, and it was invented by these Japanese this Japanese couple. Um, but they didn't stop there. They, they looked at the, at the structure of amino caproic acid and they thought, well, let's see if we can get an even better inhibitor. And they got this thing, this shaped molecule. This is called tranexamic acid. And it's, it's a much better inhibitor of plasmid. And then eventually they, um, they were really interested in postpartum hemorrhage. And they wanted to do trials of postpartum hemorrhage, but they couldn't get their local obstetricians to work with them. And uh, eventually they gave it to a pharmaceutical, pharmaceutical company who marketed this as a treatment for heavy menstrual bleeding and uh, the, the sort of bleeding you get after you have your teeth taken out. But trauma surgeons had, but no, not trauma surgeons, surgeons had started using it. And so if, you know, um, and so they, there were more and more randomized controlled trials of tranexamic acid in trauma so that's what, you know, you, in surgery rather. So you, your patient's going to go have an operation. They're randomly allocated to get tranexamic acid or placebo. If they get tranexamic acid, they bleed much less. They really are much less likely to need a blood transfusion. And even actually when you add up all, all the previous surgical trials, there's even less death in the um, tranexamic acid treated group. So we saw this data and we thought, my goodness, you know, this is a drug that really works in terms of reducing bleeding. Perhaps it works in bleeding trauma patients. So we thought well, the only way we're going to find out is we're going to do a large trial because it's not going to, you know, it's not going to be a cure for exsanguination, but it could make a, a little bit of difference at the margin. So we managed, we put, a, put together a protocol for an international trial and then worked with lots of doctors from lots of countries, just like we did in the CRASH-1 trial, um, we managed to, you know, something like 250 hospitals again. This, in 40 countries, we managed to randomize 20,000 patients. So 20,000 patients randomized to get tranexamic acid. 10,000 got tranexamic acid. 10,000 got placebo. We followed them up till death or hospital discharge. We got good follow-up rates. And then we just got this beautiful result. So shocking, um, so surprising that there was a highly statistically significant reduction in the risk of bleeding to death if you give tranexamic acid. Um, and there was also a highly statistically significant reduction in all-cause mortality with tranexamic acid. So a nice result. But because the trial was so big, because the network of collaborators was so big, we actually had lots of statistical power. And so we actually could do some subgroup analyses. And this is one subgroup analysis we'd planned in advance. We anticipated that the effect of tranexamic acid might be greater when given soon after injury and less effective later. And we found this to a very large extent. If you give tranexamic acid within an hour of injury, something like a 30% reduction in the risk of bleeding to death. If you give it two to three hours later, 20% reduction. And if you give it very much later, there was no reduction at all. In fact, it seemed to increase the risk of bleeding to death. So, because this was a really big trial, 
we actually got a good answer overall, but we actually learned even more about the biological mechanism of action of tranexamic acid, important information when we come to apply it in clinical practice. And then another fantastic thing about the results is that there didn't seem to be any side effects. If you give a drug that helps clotting, most people expect that it will increase the risk of unwanted clotting. But it didn't. In fact, it reduced the risk of unwanted, clot unwanted clotting. We got less myocardial infarction, less stroke, a little bit less uh, vascular occlusive events, venous events with tranexamic acid. So this is a drug that reduces your risk of bleeding to death, and reduces your risk of unwanted vascular occlusive events. And it's very cheap. So it's a highly cost-effective treatment. So we did, you know, I don't know, the economists did various cost-effective analyses. You know, it's, it's cost-effective everywhere in the world. It's cost-effective in Britain, India, Africa, wherever you use it. It's one of the most cost-effective ways to save a life from anything. The, one of the few things that are better are bed nets for preventing malaria. But it's a highly cost-effective intervention. So we publish it in the medical journal, and we think everything's going to be fine, but then we start seeing editorials. So this is an editorial in the Australian Medical Journal and by Russell Gruen, and, and it, raising concerns about the results. And this is what, and the concern, the concern they raised is what one of the, what I want to address, really, in, in this uh, presentation. So they said, the first concern concerns the efficacy of tranexamic acid in patients treated to modern trauma care standards. Now, it, I'll make no mistake, many of the patients were recruited in very, in low and middle income settings where, I'm sure the next speaker is going to talk about this as well, where the amount of kit and the, you know, the, the, the general sort of, um, the, you know, the, they're highly resource-constrained environments. And so this, um, the concern was being raised here, well, it well, was basically, well, okay, that might be all right for poor countries, but it probably doesn't, those results don't apply to rich countries. And there was something else about, you know, the baseline mortality rate in the trial was much higher than we see in Australia so we don't really need the tranexamic acid in, in Australia. You know, it only, only applies where the death rates are too high, possibly because the standard of care is too low. Um, so to put it in visual forms, you know, this is, this is Ibadan in Nigeria, where one of our trauma centers is. Um, and the houses look like that. So they're saying, well, look, the results work in places like that, but not like that. They work in in hospitals that look like this. This is one of our trauma centers in um, Peru, one collaborating centers in Peru. They work in, in hospitals that look like that. You see, look on the background wall, you know, there's just very basic stuff. There's no, nothing fancy in this picture, but not like that. You know, they don't look, you know, where people have fancy things hanging from the ceiling. And they end up in ICUs like that. This one's in Iran, uh, and not ICUs like that, where you've got all the posh gear. So this is the criticism that if you get results from low and middle income countries, or, or from, actually, you know, Britain took part as well, um, but there were a lot, several high income countries, but if predominantly the results come from low and middle income countries, they don't apply to high income settings. Now the other one, the other criticism, which I, I started doing large trials in adults, I was a pediatrician, as, as, the, as you, you heard in the bio, the, I started off as a pediatrician, I was, in, I was working in trauma care, but I thought we'll only find effective treatments for children if we, if we can start doing some large trials in adults. So the other concern was that, okay, we did this trial, CRASH-2, in adults, so the results don't apply to children. I was disappointed with that. And I, I spent a long time trying to understand what's the error in thinking that leads to these conclusions that the treatment doesn't work in high income settings because it was primarily tested in low and middle income settings. It doesn't, the results don't apply to children because only adults were included in the trial. And I feel that I, I, I'm getting to understand, that I understand what the confusion is. And I think it's a confusion between statistical inference 
and scientific inference. Now, I think I understand it, but whether I can explain it to you, you'll be the best judge of that. So when we do, um, if we want to say something about a bigger population, so if I wanted to say something about the drinking habits of the surgeons in this audience here, it's better if I took a random sample of the audience, asked their drinking habits, uh, it, I would get a better handle on the drinking pattern the average drinking patterns of, of, of surg surgeons, if I took a random sample, than if I just, for example, asked the women. So when we're wanting to say something about a bigger population, taking a representative sample makes good sense. But when we're doing clinical trials, that's not what we're doing. When we, we're not trying to say something about a bigger population, we're trying to find a truth about how biology works. So this statistical inference and scientific inference get mixed up in people's minds. So they think that if a clinical, that for the results of a clinical trial to apply, the people, the person that you've got to, you want to apply it in has to be sort of, they would have been represented in the trial population. I, and I think that's the mistake. So randomized controlled trials are all about understanding how biology works. And I, I just want to sort of dissect a randomized trial result so you can see it's all about how, how biology works. So this is the main result of the trial. Now, the clinical trials res results, the main result is something called the relative risk. That's the risk of death in those who got the treatment divided by the risk of death in those who don't get the treatment. But we can simplify it even further than that because the ratio of risks is just the ratio of deaths in the two groups. So this measure, this, this relative risk of 0.85 here is it's absolutely 489 divided by 574. So there are about, almost, let's just round up, there are about 500 deaths in the treated groups and about 600 deaths in the placebo group. I, I know that's heroic rounding, but um, just for, for simplicity. So it's, you know, it's basically just five over six. So the, the relative risk, the thing that we take from a randomized trial, the relative risk is just the ratio of events in the two groups. And that's, that's an important insight because the purpose of a control group in a randomized control trial is to tell you what you would have seen in the treated group had they not been treated. So had the tranexamic acid group not received tranexamic acid group, we wouldn't have got 500 deaths, we would have got 600 deaths. And so it's, they're telling you what you would have seen and they, and they do that because when you randomize large numbers of patients, the, the baseline characteristics are the same in both groups. So baseline characteristics are the same for all, you know, age, sex, GCS, everything, blood pressure, they're almost identical the same. With 20,000 patients, there's hardly any difference at all. They're even the same on things that you haven't measured. So if there was some really important prognostic factor for trauma and you didn't know what it was, you hadn't measured it, it would be the same in two groups because you've randomly allocated patients. So what randomized controlled trials do is they identify the biological effect of treatments. So this is just a schema of the trial results. So I said, you know, there are about 500 deaths in the, in the treated group, about 600 deaths in, in the untreated group. So this, you know, like take each one of these could represent 100 or you could say, so the base, let's just do five or six, one, two, three, four, five divided by six. Um, so the relative risk is 0.83. Um, and what, what the treatment's done is blocked the biological mechanism leading to death in one patient. So randomized trials are all about biological mechanisms. They're telling us how biology works. That's what they're for. And, you know, the, there was a criticism from uh, the, this Australian group. He said, well, look, the, the, the risk of death in our setting is different from the risk of death in the trial, and so you know, we can't generalize to a much lower risk population. Well, the, 
the real information in the trial is just the biological effect is contained in the ratio of events. You can have lots of non-events and they don't change anything. The, the proportion of non-events doesn't change the biological effect of the treatment in those who do. So relative risks, which tell us the biological effect of the treatment, are almost invariant of baseline risk. So it doesn't really matter what the baseline risk is, it's the relative risk that's the only thing you take from a trial and that's widely generalizable. So if you've got a third reduction with tranexamic acid, like you do if you give it within an hour of injury, so a third reduction, that third reduction is the same whether your risk of bleeding to death is 30%, the tranexamic acid will reduce it to 20%. If your risk of death is 3%, tranexamic acid will reduce that to 2%. The proportional reduction is widely generalizable, the absolute reduction is not. The other thing to bear in mind that it's the only generalizable measure from a randomized control trial is the effect of the treatment on the outcome that's biologically relevant to the mechanism of action of the treatment. So I've tried to illustrate this here. So we've got these, um, these red dots are deaths due to bleeding. Uh, so in the treated group, there are five. In the untreated group, there are 10. So the relative risk is five over 10.5. And then you've got these other deaths that are not affected by the tranexamic acid treatment in this case or some other thing. And so obviously the numbers of deaths are gonna be the same in the two groups. All cause mortality, if you add up all of the deaths here and compare it to the all, that gives you the wrong answer. It's 0.69. And because other causes of death are, can vary be, between different settings, co all cause mortality isn't a generalizable measure, just cause specific mortality. So the purpose of a randomized trial is to tell us the biological effect of the, of the treatment on, on a particular cause of death. And that's widely generalizable. So this idea about sampling, that's a mistake. You know, we're not doing random sampling here because of trying to you know, make an inference of a wider population. We're trying to understand how biology works. And so when we generalize results from clinical trials, we've got to think about biology. We've got to think, well, is there any good biological reason why tranexamic acid would work differently in posh trauma centers. You might be able to think of one. I, you know, I, I can't. You, similarly, is there any biological reason why tranexamic acid would, would work differently in children? I'm a, I trained in pediatrics, and the pediatricians have this, have this mantra. They get, you know, the children aren't little adults. But flipping heck, they are little adults. <laughs> Certainly, in respect to their coagulation, you know, they haven't got some mysterious pediatric version of fibrin. They haven't got some strange pediatric version of plasmin. It's all the same stuff. So there's no good biological reason why tranexamic acid won't work in children. But this is a really serious injury. There are thousands of children ex exsanguinating every year who are not being treated with tranexamic acid because, trauma, because pediatric trauma surgeons don't believe it's applicable to them because they've got, they're using this sampling framework. So this is where the action is. This yellow stuff is fibrin. It's chopped up by plasmin and tranexamic acid inhibits plasmin, stops it sitting on, on top of the fibrin and stops it chopping it up. So that's, what, that's where the action is. So what you've got to think, if you think, you're thinking about generalizability, is what is that? It has to be relevant to that mechanism, that biological mechanism. Now, where does age of the child sit in there? Well, it doesn't fit in anywhere. You know, it's the same whatever the age. Where does having lots of monitors on the roof fit in there? Well, it doesn't fit in anywhere, you know? It's irrelevant to the mechanism of action. The mechanism of action is this. You know, the blood vessels give out TPA. TPA activates plasminogen. Plasminogen, pl so it has to be in there somewhere if it's going to be relevant to the, to the mechanism of action. And actually, since the trial results, actually people have learned more about the biological mechanism of action, especially, the, you know, people, there's been a lot of research in the U.S. military. I think it's made a really important contribution to our understanding of the mechanism and so this is what, you know, Andre Kapp and his colleagues at, um, I don't know where, but uh, 
um, using a rat model of trauma, you know, immediately after trauma, you get a boost of tissue plasminogen activator, where all your, your endothelium lets out these granules of, um, of, of TPA into the blood. You get this very early surge in TPA, and that activates plasmin. So this is, you know, this is about half an hour. Plasmin activation happens really soon. Then you start, you know, fibrinolysis is, is really um, florid soon after injury. But after a while, if you leave it a, a little while, then this other molecule called plasminogen activator inhibitor wakes up and starts inhibiting fibrinolysis. So the result from the trial fits very well with what we know about the biology. You know, you get early hyperfibrinolysis and late hypofibrinolysis. So if your tranexamic acid is going to work early, it's going to, if it's going to work at all, it's going to work early. So in terms of biological mechanisms, tranexamic acid should work everywhere. You know, it should work on, you know, irrespective of the color of your skin, how posh your trauma center is. It should work everywhere. And it shouldn't be necessary for me to make slides like this, which is a subgroup analysis that I did in response that was stimulated by, by this uh, provocation from these Australians who say, well, you know, it works in poor places, but it probably doesn't work in, in, in rich places. So this is a subgroup analysis by a continent. You must, there's no point make, cutting the day. And of course it works in the EU, Australia, and Canada. And they're reasonably posh places too. So, in fact, you know, it seems to work a little bit more there than, than in, in, the other cases, in the other places. But in truth, there's no real statistical sig significant difference between of all these. So the benefits, working together with trauma surgeons all around the world, we can identify effective treatments that are relevant to trauma care all around the world. That's the main thrust of, of, of what I want to, want to say. And so trauma is a global health problem. Doctors from high, middle, and low income settings can work together to find effective treatments because no matter where, of the, where in the world we come from, we're essentially the same basic human beings. Now, I didn't say that. The Dalai Lama said that in his, um, in his when the speech when he said uh, he accepted the Nobel Prize for Peace Prize. But my, the message isn't to say anything about world peace. And it, it's basically, you know, we emphasize the differences between us too much and not the similarities. We share the same biology with, doc with patients all around the world, and so we can learn from that. So I hope we can carry on doing large-scale global international trials, and people will uh, consider seriously the results. Thank you very much. Okay, in that case, I've got a question for you. Yeah. How do you put together a network of 247 hospitals in 40 countries and fund an RCT. And you've got 10 seconds to answer. And fund an RCT. <laughs> yeah. Okay, putting the ne network together is very easy. Actually, there are thousands of doctors in trauma centers all around the world who see, who see oodles of trauma every day. They don't know what to do about it. And if you say, would you want to work on this problem together to try and find an effective treatment. They are delighted. They, so it, all you have to do is ask them. And, they, and you know, the, the willingness of people to want to work with you is, is immense. The difficulty is the last thing, is the funding. Um, and that's, I, I think the difficulty is the, the sort of parochial thinking of funders. So for example, when we got Crash 2 funded, that was funded by the NIHR, they were still in their kind of, they would let you do global trials. But subsequent to that, they, they got very um, reluctant for NIHR funds to be spent outside of the UK because they go, well, look, this is the NHS. It's NHS money, and we can't, we don't want the taxpayer thinking, we're, you know, NHS money is paying for patients. And, but I personally think it, it's a mistake because... You know, we can either have very unreliable information uh, that doesn't serve the British public well, or we can have a global collaboration. You know, we do trials with doctors in lower middle income countries, and we get to an answer fast that's good for them and it's good for us. I mean, you know, the, 
some of the beneficiaries of these doctors working in lower middle income countries it has been, it has been you know, British servicemen. They were the first to benefit because thanks to um, uh, um, Commander Raffaelli and people like that, you know, there was very rapid uh, implementation of tranexamic acid into, into military medical practice. Yeah. Thank you, Ian. Any other questions from the floor? Well. So, it gives me great pleasure to present Professor Roberts with uh, the Guthrie Medal. Uh, this is struck in bronze by Spink. Uh, on the obverse, it has a, uh, an image of Guthrie, um, and on the reverse, uh, an, an image of the uh, Ministry of Defence crest. Um, it contains metal uh, taken from artillery cases fired in Afghanistan in 2009 uh, by the commandos. And it's a great pleasure for me to be able to award this to you this year. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. I appreciate that. Thanks. Our next speaker um, is Mr. Mike Walsh. Uh, Mike is a consultant surgeon and head of uh, surgery at the School of Medicine at the University of Botswana. Mike trained at Mary's in London, intercalating a degree in biophysics, and went on, on to undertake a master's of surgery degree in wound healing at the London Hospital. As a consultant vascular and trauma surgeon, Mike was central to the development of the trauma centre at the Royal London Hospital and was head of the unit in two thousand, until 2012, when he took up the post of head of surgery in the department at the University of Botswana in Gaborone. With his immense experience of trauma care, Mike is now a passionate advocate for the development of health services in the developing world and in Botswana in particular, both in terms of infrastructure and human capital. Mike, thank you very much indeed. Good morning. What comes around comes around. I was struck this morning when uh, Professor Morang, he spoke, Morang spoke about uh, bombings and terrorist threat. And I think the first time I spoke to an audience like this at the association, I talked about the London bombings. The subsequent two times I've spoken, it's been about trauma systems and their effectiveness. And that was for trauma systems, how we would develop it in the UK, and then what happened when we did it at the Royal London. And now I find I'm coming back to talk about trauma systems in a developing country. And I think what Professor Roberts has just said about the people and what happens to them is the same wherever you go. And people die in Botswana from trauma the same way as they died in London. They're, they're injured and their lives are affected in exactly the same way. Trauma affects the breadwinners. Yeah? And the effect on a breadwinner in London is devastating for their family, but they have social support. The breadwinner in Botswana, when he loses his leg, that's his whole extended family, if he's feeding them all, is struggling then for the rest of their lives. So I'm going to talk about how can we improve trauma care using Botswana as an example across the less developed world. And this, if you come to Botswana this year, I gather Botswana is one of the top tourist destinations for 2016. This is what you see in the arrivals hall which tells you that Botswana is starting to take deaths from trauma seriously. And they don't want the tourists going home to say, my God, I had a bad accident, it was awful in Botswana. Okay? And this is part of a prevention program. The problem, I'm going to talk just about road traffic collisions. There's about 500 deaths. That's 25 per 100,000 people in Botswana. Botswana has a population just over 2 million. It will be the largest cause of mortality in 2030. Now, Botswana is famous in the medical world for HIV, and it, going from the world's the worst mortality rate from HIV to gradually improving and improving survival in HIV. But up until recently, HIV, TB, infectious disease was the, was, was the leading cause of death. But if you add road traffic collisions, plus burns, plus violence, plus suicide, plus industrial incidents, you have a really serious problem for a population of 2 million. It's currently the third largest cause of death overall, and it's the second highest cause of attendance at, at, at the emergency rooms in Botswana. 
There was an assessment carried about, about how well developed was Botswana for trauma care. This is a, 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 along the minimum standards set by the WHO. There's no emergency medical system. There's a stepwise referral system going from a local clinic to a primary hospital to a secondary hospital to the referral hospital. There's a lack of basic equipment. So if you're in the, the district hospital, you may not have the equipment to intubate a patient. You may not have the equipment to put in a chest strain. You certainly won't have x-ray readily available and you won't have a CT scanner. There's a lack of trained staff. There is no trauma training for medical or for clinical staff in Botswana currently. When I say in the referral centers, trained staff not able to use this skill. So a surgeon who's trained in South Africa or UK returns to his home country because of the lack of organization and the lack of equipment may not be able to do the very clever laparotomy or thoracotomy that's required. There's no trauma education. There's no administration or organization for trauma. The organization is for the primary healthcare model common in very many African countries. There have been previous efforts to improve trauma care in Botswana. There was a series of best training, which is a model similar to ATLS, which is a training course which is suited for low and middle income countries. And in fact, a team visited all the hospitals it was funded by the Norwegian government and the, and the, the funding ran out. And by the, when the funding ran out, there'd been no local trainers had been trained. So no further courses occurred. There's little memory in the system now. Part of that is the reason that staff are rotated through different hospitals and different departments without any recourse to what is their training and their skill. So a good example, there's an... I, in our orthopedic ward, the sister on the orthopedic ward is actually a psychiatric nurse and was moved from being head of psychiatry in the whole psychiatric hospital to be a ward sister on the orthopedic ward. Now you can imagine what that does for the care of the patients and what that does for the trained orthopedic nurses on her ward and how can she manage that. And there's been no repeat training. In 2010, the Two of the doctors, one was Norwegian and one was from Ethiopia, who'd been involved in the best training, thought we could set up a system in Botswana for tra trauma care. They managed to get two centers designated, one of which did implement some plans, but they didn't really have the full engagement of the Ministry of Health. And there was no emergency medical service, and there's no overall authority. So by 2011, it was non-functioning. Which wasn't surprising, because if you look what's happened in the UK, when it, it took us 50 years to implement a trauma system, roughly from when it was first proposed, and a lot of that was because it was never, there was never a leadership role from, from the top, from the, from the Department of Health. Luckily, we have the WHO. And this is a global plan, the decade of action for road safety. I wonder, has anybody in the UK had anything to do with this plan? Any surgeon in the room here, anything to do with this plan? One, Ian has, because he was involved in, in, in helping to write it. But actually, so when in 2015 I was invited to a meeting to discuss this by the Ministry of Health in Botswana, I thought, my God, it's taken four years. And then I started asking around in the UK. Well, the UK hasn't even started yet. And they based it on five pillars, road safety, Safer roads, safer vehicles, safer road users, and post-crash response. If you take road safety management, that's about how you organize your roads. And if you go into Botswana on any tarred road, I defy you to find a pavement you can walk on. Okay? If you go on a gravel road, I can defy you to find that it's been graded recently. And then when you go into the remote areas, I defy you to find a sand road that doesn't have big pits by the side of it where vehicles have tipped into it, tipped over. So there's an issue about how do we make safe roads. Safer vehicles. You look at the lorries that drive on the main roads that are going from South Africa, going through to Zimbabwe and DRC, and you look at their tires, and they're smooth. They'd be great on an F1 track, but not in a great big truck. You know, so there are big issues there, and safer road users. 
here now in the, in the, I suspect there's virtually nobody in the room here would put their hand up and say they've drunk after two glasses of wine or a pint of beer. But in Botswana, it is still socially acceptable from all groups, whether you're an expatriate or whether you're a local or whether you're rich or poor, that you can get in your car when you've been drinking. Okay? So there's a real issue about how people's attitude to road safety. Now, those are four pillars. Those first four pillars, I'm not going to talk about anymore because they have, there are plans for dealing with those that have been taken by other groups. But I'm being tasked with doing something about the post-crash response. So luckily, the meeting where we discussed this is coordinated by the motor vehicle accident body, which is like an insurance group which takes money from the road fund license to help with health care. And most importantly, the Ministry of Health. Okay? And the ministers and the permanent secretaries from the Ministry and Road and Transport attended the meeting and were there for the whole day. Okay? So there's now a drive to do something about trauma care in Botswana. So in the post-crash response, there's an agreement that a trauma system needs to be implemented and the EMS implementation needs to be fast-forwarded. So I'm heading up, starting to head up a task force. We have a mandate. We're setting up our terms of reference about what are we going to do about trauma care? How are we going to involve people? What is going to be the plan? And what are we going to do to develop EMS? So there is a group of trauma-interested clinicians, both expatriate like myself and locals. We have two referral hospitals. One fortunately has neurosurgery, but there is no real significant rehabilitation. We have three physios for 550 beds. There are nine district hospitals, only five of which have general surgery. Three of those only have one general surgeon. Okay? One has orthopedics, and nobody, no district hospital has a CT scanner. Okay? So you can't guarantee that you will have 25 a day, seven day a week provision of general surgery in the district hospitals. And then there are 16 primary hospitals who have no reliable surgery at all and may even struggle to do a caesarean section for a lady in, in, in labor. There's no trauma educational research and there's no trauma registry currently. But fortunately, the police collect very good data on every road traffic collision. This is a map of Botswana. For those who don't, who don't know about it, if you look on, this is the corridor where most of the population live. About three quarters of the population live on the road between Labatsi and Francis Town. And it's mostly centered around Hamaroni and Francis Town. Here is the central Kalahari. It's the largest sand pit in the world, which I always tell my kids, and they love to say, Dad, can we go camping and we can dig in the sand? Here's the Okavango Delta. So you can get a road traffic collision along here, you might be okay. But if you get one here between Mao and Hanzi, there's a district hospital in Mao with one surgeon, there's no surgeon in Hanzi. If you come down here between the Transfrontier Park and Hanzi, there is a district hospital here in, in Hukunsi. Okay? But if you get an accident near here, you go to Hukunsi, they send you to Hanzi. So you're going further away from where you can get surgery and have a own. Yeah? So there's a real issue in the system. Okay? If you get bitten by a crocodile here in the Okavango, you're almost certainly to, be, to, to die, even if they've only just amputated your limb. Because getting you out from there with no proper emergency system is impossible. If you're on this road between here and here, it's a nice tarred road, but it's full of huge lorries which are going between South Africa and Vintuk and Woolworths Bay in Namibia and are headed up towards Zambia and the DRC. And the crashes on there are, are horrendous and there is no facility along that road where you can get surgery. So we're going to look at the problem. We're going to look at a public health model and an inclusive system that involves all the clinical facilities so that the local clinics can deal with the minor injuries, that the primary hospitals are able to resuscitate somebody and organize a safe transfer into the tertiary centers. And I've put the public there because the public are very well informed about HIV now. Okay? But they know virtually nothing about injuries. And when somebody gets 
killed is God's, God's will. Now, whether you're a Christian or not, you believe in God or not, that's fine, but we know that we can intervene in the process of God's will. Okay? But a lot of people in the public in Botswana need to have that education that no, they don't have to die. I put the MPs there because the MPs are very similar. When we set up the London trauma system, we had to go and talk to the local councils and the councillors under there. And you, it's a real job to convince them that by moving a handful of patients to a major trauma centre, your population is going to do better and your local hospital isn't going to suffer. Because every MP in Botswana wants to have their local primary hospital an all singing, all dancing hospital. That's a natural thing. And that's a natural thing to go and tell your electorate but doesn't really help trauma care in Botswana. So we have to persuade the MPs to do the things that we want them to do, to pass the legislations where it's required. I've put the clinical services department of the Ministry of Health because they are the ones who control where staff go, who gets training, and have the hands on the purse. So we have to persuade them about not rotating staff inappropriately, about making sure that appropriate staff get appropriate training. And we need to go to the Motor Vehicle Accident Fund to help us fund things. Because at the moment, they fund an individual patient if a request comes for ongoing care for trauma. But they may be better off spending their money on a population-based basis on things that will help the whole population. And what we don't have is this. This is a picture from the Royal London. I think uh, we've already seen enough pictures. I don't have this. When I set up a trauma team, in Botswana, it's going to have three or four members who aren't going to be able to work in this all singing, all dancing environment. So the needs, we need information. We need a functioning EMS who are going to need proper triage protocols so that when you're out in the middle of nowhere, do you take that patient to the local facility or do we get an ambulance to drive you straight to Haberoni, which might take you four hours but it might mean you get definitive care in four hours instead of 24 hours. And that's a very difficult balancing act in a country like the shape of Botswana, which is very different from the UK, and it's something I have to take advice from from local people. We need good functioning clinical services. So, for example, I was called to help a colleague who had opened a patient who he thought had a massive hemothorax, and in fact he had a cardiac tamponade, and he sutured what he thought was the hole in the heart because no, no more blood came out. And actually what he had sutured was the pericardium. Okay, so there is something about, we need to make sure that even if you're a specialist, you get appropriate training to look after seriously injured patients. Rehabilitation is obviously a major problem. And if you're in a low and middle income country, efficient use of resources is vital. I can't justify asking the ministry to put a CT scanner in every hospital. That's not, re that's not realistic. And actually, most of the things we're talking about don't cost a lot of money. They cost a lot of time and energy and, they, and uh, an organization. But money isn't going to be at the root of how we improve things. It has to be driven by standards. And we have to have some research. And we have to have a governance framework to make sure things work properly. So we're using the police data, the data we've got, because there's a, the police have a report on everybody who's died in a road traffic collision. So I'm hoping to be able to look at all of those and say, was there a possibly preventable cause of death? So if there's a blood in the belly or blood in the chest, if we'd have managed to get that patient to the hospital, could we've got a, a life saved? We can also find where are the injury hotspots. So when we set up our EMS, we can target the ambulances to the areas that have the most crashes rather than trying to spread them out all over that country the size of France with very localised populations. We're running a head injury audit at the moment. The hospital I'm working in, Princess Marina, gets three se severe head injuries a week. Okay? Only about 10% of those patients who require ventilation get ventilation in intensive care currently. So there are things we have to do about head injury. The other issue about head injuries is if you have an extra dural and you're in Hansi, it may and you get taken to Hansi, it may take you 24 hours to get to the referral centre to have a hole drilled in your head. And that's my, that was my, this morning, it was very good to hear the military are actually allowing orthopaedic and general surgeons to drill holes in the head, because I may be able to train medical officers to drill holes in the head at the appropriate time in the appropriate place. <laughs>
We're looking at burns as a serious issue. We're coming to the winter in Botswana now, and we will probably have somewhere between four and five burns a day admitted. And yet the standard of our burn care is very poor, so we need an audit to say this is where we need to improve. And we're just starting our registry now. EMS is in its infancy. We have started along that main road I pointed out to you between Labatsi and Francis Town, and we're starting to train paramedics. But we're, you know, we're starting from scratch. No, zero trained paramedics. In fact, the head of the ambulance service is, is, a, is, a, is an army officer who was trained abroad and is a very good paramedic, and now he's got the job of organizing everybody. The triage has to be a local solution. And I'm not an expert on triage in a country like Botswana. I'm, I'm an expert on triage in London. And so I, 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 you, I, you know, I'm not relying on my knowledge to, to put the triage system in place. I have to rely on local knowledge to put our triage system in place. When is it appropriate to take somebody from the roadside directly to the referral centre when that's a 700 kilometre drive? When is it appropriate to take them to the nearest facility and can we train that facility to do the necessary? All right, because what you want to avoid is the stepwise patient transfer from clinic to primary to district to referral hospital because that inevitably takes 48 to 72 hours. And I think we're going to need to do some modeling and there, there are now some nice software out there to model these kind of things, which is the, going to be the safest way to organize your triage. Obviously, clinical services, we need to, the development and deployment of staff is important. The medical school is obviously going to have an important role here now. The medical school has been running for just over seven years. There are two lots of graduates now. And so I'm currently teaching the third cohort to, to pass through. So we're now in the process, we're ready to, to get a surgical training program off the ground. And obviously, trauma, in general surgery, trauma accounts for 60% of our admissions. So trauma will obviously take a big role in the training of our general surgeons, of our orthopedic surgeons, of our neurosurgeons when we get them. There needs to be a clarity of the roles of the various components of the health system. And we have to avoid isolated services. So on that map of Botswana, halfway between Hamaroni and Francistown is a town called Mahalapi. And the government, in their wisdom, and I can understand why, thought, let's put an orthopedic centre halfway along that road, because that seems to be where most of the big crashes occur. So they put an isolated orthopedic unit, staffed with five orthopedic surgeons, and they're very good orthopedic surgeons. But in that hospital, they don't have general surgery. They, they don't have emergency medicine. They don't have a, a, a blood bank. The blood comes from the National Bank blood laboratory who gives them, sends them blood. So they've got an isolated orthopedic surgeon dealing with multiple injuries and no neurosurgeon, no general surgeon. So that kind of thing has to be avoided and we have to be able to influence the ministry in how they deploy staff. I guess I'm going back to Tony Blair, isn't it? Education, education, education. But that, for me, is the root of how we're going to improve trauma care because once you get a cohort of people who know what they're doing, you can then get a bigger cohort if you use them to train other people and then train other people. So we've devised our own primary trauma course suitable for our staff, which can be delivered in one day. So, so far we've delivered two courses, amounting to 42 staff, med doctors and nurses, and we've demonstrated an improvement in the performance of primary assessment of trauma patients. And the, the study we used we looked at before and after in real patients, which is a really, when I looked in the literature, if you look at ATLS, when they show improvement, they show improvement on moulage, or they, they show improvement on, an, on a test. But very, studies, very few studies show improvement on real patients. We've also thought about, if you're at 700 kilometers from the nearest reasonable hospital, who's gonna look after you? Now, that could be a local person, but you have to, the local person has to be passing by. It could be the paramedic, but who's going to call them? And of course, it's the police. The police attend every road traffic collision. So when we talk to the police officers, they have no training in first aid. They get harassed. When the local people turn up at a crash, they get harassed. Why aren't you doing anything for that patient who's lying there gurgling? Well, of course, they're not doing anything because they don't know what to do. Now, in some countries, in Ghana, they've chosen to take the professional drivers as their, their, their first uh, responder. So that's the lorry drivers and the taxi drivers. Our difficulty is lots of the lorry drivers are, are foreigners, 
and they may not stop or want to stop or be involved in that kind of thing. And how do you indemnify those people? The other thing is nobody's going to take a taxi between Haberoni and Hansi, 700 kilometers across the desert. So, but the police go to every, uh, every call. So we've chosen to train the, the, the traffic police. And so far, we've done five courses and trained 100 policemen. So we're waiting to see now, can they retain that knowledge and do they use that knowledge? And that will be our next assessment. There's something about definitive trauma surgery skills, but at a level that's lower than how we understand definitive trauma surgery in the UK or, or, or America. And there's also about training other health professionals. When I take somebody with a ruptured spleen to the theater, the theater nurse doesn't necessarily understand the urgency or the equipment that's required because she may not be a proper theatre nurse. She may have been somebody who's been rotated from a medical ward to be a nurse in theatre. So there's an issue then about training all the other health professionals. And that goes with when you, get, when you take a patient into the emergency room, the nurse who you meet may not have had any experience in the emergency room before she's sent there. And we've talked about educating the public and the, and the politicians. There are standards, local standards. Now, we have a nice guideline that says you have to have a CT within four hours of your head injury. Let me put you in Hukunsi, which is that hospital near the Transfrontier Park with your head injury. And at the moment, you have to go to Hansi, and then from Hansi, you can come to Haberoni. Haberoni is where you can get a CT scan. You're not going to get your CT scan in four hours, so there's no point using that as a standard. So we have to make a standards that are appropriate for the environment we're working in. And somebody coming from a remote area, it might be reasonable to say, let's have a CT within 12 hours. And this is where we have to consult and involve the local staff. Now, if you've worked in some of these countries which take on the old colonial system, it's a very top-down arrangement. Okay, the colonial system was the district commissioner told the assistant commissioner who told so-and-so what to do. And that is the system that's currently working in the Ministry of Health. So it's not usual to go and consult with staff. It's not usual to allow staff to decide what should happen. And I think that's something we have to persuade our leaders and our uh, officials in the ministry. We have to consult with the staff and we have to involve them when we, tell, when we want to institute local solutions. Mike, yep. so we're just a little bit out of time. Okay, okay, okay. right. So well, there's obviously going to have to be a designated designation process, but I th on the bottom is robust plans to ensure that we get the equipment we need. There has to be important performance improvement. There has to be researchers embedded from the start. The opportunities here are for lo other lower middle coming coming trades. Because we've got very poor organisation at the moment, we can look at different aspects of a trauma system and see which ones are the most effective.